I'm delighted to introduce to you Reverend Dr. Lauren Winner. Lauren comes to us as first in a new series. Um, we're going to be bringing in a number of speakers that are looking at some topics that have to do with some things and some practices and looking at those topics in relationship to God. So next week we have a speaker named Dr. Fred Bonson who's coming in to talk about being grounded. Followed by that we have Reverend Corky Carlisle who's coming in to tell some stories about money. Followed by the Reverend Catherine Bush on February the 16th is coming in to talk about home. Followed by, last but not least, Sam Pitaro who's going to be talking about work. Lauren is here to talk to us about rest. More about that in a moment. She teaches at Duke. She is the author of many wonderful and well-received books, some of whom, some of which are on a table by Juan. Please wave to us, Juan. Yes. And Lauren is going to be signing books at that table with Juan and Harriet following Sunday school. If you did not bring cash or check, don't worry about it. We will cover you because we trust you. Um, we know where to find you. I am thrilled about this series for a number of reasons. If you've read Lauren's books or heard her online, you know that she's a person of profound faith, but she's also quirky and creative and observant of all these strange and mysterious things that make us who we are. And that's why I'm just delighted that she is here. Her subject is rest. And Lauren, I was talking, talking to somebody last week and talking about you, and I said she's talking about rest. And the person said, as in... Eternal rest? <laughs> or like rest, rest. And I said, I don't know. <laughs> and now we can find out. So please welcome her warmly to Grace St. Louis. Thank you. I had not planned to talk about eternal rest. I do teach a whole course at Duke, though, on death and dying. So if people want to segue into the topic of eternal rest, I can do that. Um, I'm going to actually say that I'm not talking about rest. Um, I'm going to broaden that a little bit and say that I'm talking about time. And most of what I'll talk about is rest. But I'm, I want us to think together for the next 45 minutes or so about time. And I am, I am both honored to be here. First of all, I just have to say, I think that you all have the coolest clergy ever. Having now met, I don't believe I've met your deacon. I think you have a deacon whom I've not yet met. But that is a rare thing. So I know that you all know that and hooray. Um, so it's a delight to be here for that reason. Um, I have friends in Memphis. I've managed to see a few of them in interstitial space and time. I, I didn't before this weekend have friends in this parish, but I expect to have friends from this parish that I will see next time I am here. Um, so delight to be, my, actually my first book, Girl Meets God, opens in Memphis. Um, the first or second scene of that book is set in Memphis. So I want to talk about time. I think that this five-part series that you all are embarking on is really important. Um, I think so often in the church, we think that the spiritual life is this stuff that is somehow separate from like our actual life and our day-to-day -day life, and that the spiritual stuff is stuff we do when we come to church and then we go back home or back to our office um, or back to our workaday worlds and somehow the, the twain shall never meet. And I actually think that the exact opposite of that is true. That what the Christian story has to say to us and what the incarnation has to say to us um, is that all of our life is caught up in life with God. So I think looking at these topics such as home, work, ground, uh, money, 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 um, and how those things intersect with life with God, or to, to put it another way, if we are living the entirety of our lives standing before God, then, then what is the implication for how I live in time, how I live with money, um, how I live in my home, if I am doing all of that living standing before God? And I will just finally, as a word of prologue, say Fred Bonson, who's coming next week, is awesome, and I'm sure that all of you are planning to be here next week, but if you are wavering about next week's adult forum, Stop wavering. And if you have friends who don't usually come to adult forum, Fred is fantastic. Um, I've heard him speak about uh, ground and planting before, and it's just terrific, and I think it will be life-changing for you, so come back next week. All right, on to time. Um, I want to suggest a few things about time. If you remember none of them, 
the core suggestion is simply that how we inhabit time matters. Um, politicians have understood that. People who are uh, trying to arrange power in the world have long understood that how we live in time and how we arrange time matters. And you, you know that because you can look at historical examples of political revolutions where once the revolution has happened, people revise the calendar. So for example, after the French Revolution, uh, the revolutionaries decided that it was no longer going to be 1792. It was no longer going to be a year that was dated with reference to the birth of Jesus. It was going to be year one in 1792. And the uh, event that was the referent for that was the French Revolution. The French revolutionaries also did away with the seven-day week, and they instituted a 10-day week. And everyone had one day off. This was not popular. It lasted uh, just a few years, and then people reverted to the seven-day week. The Soviet Union actually tried a similar experiment um, of totally revising the calendar um, for the, the new political era. It did, not, it did not work. So how we inhabit time matters. Um, and the Christian tradition and our scriptures have an enormous amount to say about how we live in time and how we inhabit time. Um, I am going to now leap into the topic of rest, not eternal rest, weekly rest. But before I leap into that, I want to pause and note that I'm using a slightly awkward idiom, a slightly awkward locution, that I'm talking about inhabiting time or living in time. That is an awkward locution. I'm using it intentionally. And I'm using it because the term we usually use, or the verb we usually use, is spend. Right? We talk about spending time. How did you spend the weekend? How did you spend Christmas break? Um, so that's, of course, a financial and market metaphor. And I think that when we talk about spending time, we are already automatically placing ourselves in a certain posture with reference to how we live inside of time. And in fact, when you think about it, almost all of the verbs we use for time in our 21st century English lexicon, almost all of them are borrowed from the world of finance or management. So we talk about managing time. We save time, we spend it, we waste time, um, we kill time. I, that, I, that, I suppose, does not, other than making a killing. It doesn't neatly fit into my, my theory that, that all of these terms are borrowed from the worlds of finance and management. And English-speaking people have not always done that. If you look back to the 18th century, people very rarely talked about spending time. Um, they more often spoke about passing the time. Now, if I were to ask you how you plan to pass your Sunday afternoon, unless I was talking about a kidney stone, um, <laughs> You would probably think that that was an extremely quaint-sounding, peculiar way of posing the question. But to me, it calls to mind, this isn't quite, quite the right weather, but it calls to mind front porches and rocking chairs and glasses of sweet tea or lemonade and a kind of leisurely passing of the time, right? Instead of, how are we going to spend the next half an hour? Well, we're going to spend the next half an hour talking about rest. That's, that's automatically placing us in a sort of different topography. So I've been trying for about 10 years to rid my own speech of the idiom of spending time. I have not succeeded. It is very hard to do. In fact, I challenge you to try to get through like the next week without talking about spending an hour doing this, that, or the other thing, or spending the weekend at the lake. So we're talking about inhabiting time. And and what I want to suggest, and I'm borrowing this suggestion from a wonderful book by uh, an architectural critic, Vitol Rybczynski, a book called Waiting for the Weekend. In this book, Rybczynski um, traces the history of American timekeeping. And his basic contention is that America used to live in a 6-1 rhythm, six days of work followed by one day of Sabbath keeping. And we've become a society that lives in a 5-2 rhythm, five days of work, two days of weekend. I want to briefly um, 
sort of overview the story of how that change happened. I think it's a fascinating historical account. And then I want to inquire a little into what the Christian tradition might have to say about that and whether there is sort of any way to reclaim some of that older rhythm. And actually what I want to suggest is not that we want to go back to the 18th century and the 6-1 rhythm, but maybe we want a 5-1-1 rhythm of five days of work, one day of weekend, and one day of some other kind of rest, otherwise known as Sabbath keeping. But first, I, I find this history, and again, I'm getting this from uh, Rybczynski's book, Waiting for the Weekend, I find this history of how the weekend was created and invented to be totally fascinating. Um, so the first known use of the word weekend comes from 1879 from an English periodical called Notes and Queries, and this is what was published in 1879. In Staffordshire, England, if a person leaves a home at the end of his week's work on the Saturday afternoon to spend the evening of Saturday and the following Sunday with friends at a distance, he is said to be spending his weekend at so-and-so. So in 1879, there was this new word, weekend, that apparently needed to be defined because the first published instance of the term is someone defining the weekend as Saturday afternoon and Sunday, not the whole of the 48 hours that we think of as the weekend. Um, so that's 1879. The weekend is not really well established in the United States until the early 1940s. And what happens between 1879 and the early 1940s is a couple of interesting things. Um, first of all, there starts being pressure from a number of, of sources on the notion that you have a one-day Sabbath and that, that Sabbath is full of rules and regulations, right? It may be that some of us here grew up um, in a family that had fairly rigorous Sabbath restrictions. Did anyone grow up like you couldn't go to the movies? Yeah, a few of us couldn't go to the movies or weren't allowed to go shopping or shops were closed. Now that's of course not true. So these were blue laws. They're obviously still blue laws around, but in the 18th and 19th century, there was a very dominant culture of things weren't open on Sundays. You were expected to be in church and then having uh, a leisurely day with your family, perhaps taking a nap, perhaps taking a walk. Well, there begin to be in the 19th century some debates about this. And one of the fascinating debates is, should public libraries be open on Sundays? And what's fascinating about this debate, you have on your table some handouts, which you can look at now or take with you and ponder. Uh, but on pages two and three of your handout is an excerpt from a long article in 1889. This um, article was written by a librarian in New York. Her middle name is Salome, which I just love. Mary Salome Cutler writes this article, and she is arguing that libraries should be open on Sunday, which was an innovation. And if you read what she writes in this article, particularly the little sections that I put in bold, part of what's fascinating is she's not saying the Sabbath is stupid and terrible and we should have libraries be open because we aren't interested in Sabbath keeping. What she says is the spirit of the Sabbath would be served by libraries being open. She says not everyone is going to go to church, but people who don't go to church might go to libraries. And indeed, somewhere in this two pages that I've given you, she oh, there it is, on page three, the second bold chunklet. Listen to this, I love this. To put it more definitely, there is a large class of people who will not go to church and who will not read the Bible who could be reached by the means of grace afforded by a library. So, Means of grace, like the Eucharist, so the Eucharist or a library, reaching us with the means of grace. Um, the point is, there began to be pressure on this kind of rigorous, vigorous, robust Sunday Sabbath, not because people were secular and hated the Sabbath, but because people were expanding and sort of liberalizing their idea of what what might actually be Sabbath-like. Maybe going to church was not the only Sabbath-like thing. Maybe going to a library would be a good way of entering into Sabbath practice or Sabbath-like practice. So that begins happening in the late 19th century and it begins to change how Americans keep time. 
Then a second thing that begins to happen is that labor unions begin to agitate for shorter work weeks, right? They begin to agitate um, for the working day to shrink, and it does shrink to 1900, uh, in 1900 from about 11 hours a day to about a nine day working hour, working day, nine hour working day. Um, so they're, they're agitating for the day of work to get shorter. They're also agitating for um, the work week to get shorter. So prior to, say, 1900, most people went to work six days a week, right? They went to their factory, they went to their office uh, Monday through Friday, and also on Saturday. Sunday was the only day off. This begins to change in the early 20th century as certain industries begin closing at noon on Saturday and then gradually taking all of Saturday off. Some of these industries do this because a lot of their workers are Jewish, right? And if you're Jewish and your Sabbath is on Saturday, it doesn't really help you that you have Sunday off. Um, so some of the industries change in response to Jewish uh, labor agitation. But there's also a more generalized demand um, by people of all faiths and people of all economic classes for more leisure. People begin talking about leisure. In 1934, there is a study in Westchester County, New York, that asked what should people use leisure time for? If people work for an office that has suddenly started closing at noon on Saturdays, what are they using the extra time for? And they found that people were using their leisure time uh, for seven activities, eating, visiting friends, reading, listening to the radio, sports, motoring for pleasure, <laughs> Harriet will like that, motoring for pleasure, and public entertainment. Um, it was also a convenient time to go shopping because many states still have laws that said that their stores had to be closed on Sunday. So gradually the labor union is um, advocating for Saturday work closure. And then in addition to the labor unions, by the 1920s and 30s, this movement for a two day weekend found um, a kind of unexpected group of advocates. It's not really all that surprising that underpaid factory workers are agitating to not have to go to work on Saturday. But business leaders themselves begin advocating for Saturday work closure. And they advocate for two reasons. Um, one reason is what I call sort of capitalism's justification for time off, and that is that it makes you more productive to take time off. My father has always told me that I will get more done working an 11 month year than working a 12 month year, right? So that if you take Saturday off, you'll be more productive during the five days that you are actually working than if you work yourself ragged. Um, a 1922 article from the periodical business organization and management said, Saturday closings. Personally, I believe a five-day week would represent an enhancement of business efficiency. The effect would be a freshness and vigor, which would far more than compensate for the apparent loss of time. So business gurus and management gurus start saying people will work more effectively if we give them Saturdays off. The other person who somewhat surprisingly gets really invested in the two-day weekend is Henry Ford. Now, Ford was a staunch anti-unionist. He was not a close friend of the labor movement. And yet he began mandating that his car factories would be closed on Saturdays. And this sparked other businesses and other factories to close on Saturdays. Ford didn't do this out of deep-seated concern for the well-being of his workers. He did it because motoring for pleasure was one of the activities that people use their leisure time for. And he reasoned that if people had Saturdays off, they would buy more cars. So he closed his factories on Saturdays. And indeed, it, studies show that it seemed to work, like car sales actually spike as factories in, increasingly close on Saturdays. So <clears throat> all of these pressures are reshaping how Americans have time, and they're creating this sense of a two-day weekend of Saturdays off. It was, however, controversial. And you have on your handout this cartoon. This cartoon um, shows that 
there were actually Christian groups that were very worried about people starting to take Saturdays off. Um, you see that this cartoon shows a representative of the labor movement of the AFL rewriting the commandments. So he's broken the table that says six days shall you labor and the seventh day you will have a Sabbath. He's rewriting that to say five days shall you labor and do all your work, but then the sixth and seventh days are your own to do anything you darn well please. <laughs> Moses is in the background freaking out. <laughs> and what's this right here in the front corner? It's a Ford automobile, right? <laughs> So churches, some churches were very worried about factories and businesses closing on Saturdays because they actually rightly understood that that would have an impact on Sunday also. They actually were very prescient and understood that what would happen is that we would wind up with this two-day weekend, that we would not wind up with a one-day weekend and then a one-day Sabbath. Some churches also were worried that people would go out drinking on Saturday night and then not show up Sunday morning for church. So all of these pressures are giving birth to the two-day weekend, but what finally consolidates the two-day weekend in America is the Great Depression. The Great Depression consolidates the two-day weekend, and we saw a little bit of the same behavior in our recent Great Recession, right? Because in order to try to not fire anyone, employers cut everyone's working hours. So everyone's work weeks got shorter in the Great Depression, and then after the Great Depression ended, surprise, surprise, people were not willing to just hand back over all this new leisure time. Right? So the Great Depression, which includes the passage of the Fair Labor Standards Act in 1938, which mandates the 40-hour work week, um, most industries adopt a five-day work week during the Great Depression, and then after the Depression is over, most workers were unwilling to return to a six-day work week. So that's a very quick overview of how we get to having Saturdays off, and how this concept of the weekend that in 1879 is such a vague concept that it has to actually be defined in a magazine. What are people talking about when they talk about a weekend? by 1940 is a well-established practice that we have Saturdays off. So we've moved them by 1940 from a pattern of six days of work and one day of Sabbath to five days of work and these sort of other two days floating around the weekend. What gets lost for many of us in that transition what gets lost is the historic Sabbath practice. So now back to my official topic of rest. Um, I come to the question of Sabbath practice um, partially because I'm by training a historian and I like all this history. I think it's fascinating to know how did we get the weekend and so forth. But I come uh, to the topic of Sabbath practice also um, from a sense of deep personal dissatisfaction in my own life, how I live in time and how I live with God in time. Specifically, I grew up Jewish. I became uh, a Christian when I was 21. And for many years before becoming a Christian, I practiced a fairly observant, robust, fairly restrictive, from one perspective, restrictive Sabbath. On an observant Jewish Sabbath, as you know, if you have observant Jewish friends or relatives, on a, an observant Jewish Sabbath, you, you, know, you go to synagogue and you have leisurely meals, but there's also this long list of things that you don't do, right, in the name of not working, in the name of resting on the Sabbath. An observant Jew on the Sabbath doesn't drive, doesn't cook, um, doesn't rip a sheet of paper in half. In fact, if you visit any super, super, super observant Orthodox Jews on the Sabbath. You might find when you go into the bathroom that someone has pre-ripped the toilet paper into little usable chunklets of toilet paper uh, so that you don't have to rip the toilet paper on the Sabbath. Um, now, I, I'm going to confess that when I first became a Christian, I felt sort of relieved to no longer be practicing this robust, but also um, somewhat onerous 
set up Sabbath practices. And so for a year, I felt the same way about the dietary law also. I thought it was delightful that I could now, you know, eat pepperoni pizza and eat in non-kosher restaurants. I felt freed um, from these practices. I felt freed for about a year or two, and then I began noticing that something was really missing in my spiritual life and my life as a whole. And what felt like it was missing was a sense of rhythm and a sense that, um, that there was time set aside to be with God in a particular way. Suddenly all of my days had really become the same and I'm basically by temperament a workaholic, so I just began working around the clock. Or if I wasn't working, I was you know, approaching my leisure time with workaholism with the same tendencies. If I was really gonna have leisure, I was just gonna be the best leisurely person that there was. I was gonna work hard at my leisure. Um, so I began noticing that something that I had actually taken for granted, the rhythm of a week with a Sabbath practice was missing from my life. So I began to investigate what really is a Sabbath? What does the Bible have to say about the Sabbath? What do Jewish and Christian traditions have to say about a Sabbath? What's the point of a Sabbath? And is there any way as a Christian to sort of recover some Sabbath practices? I, I did not decide that I would start observing the kind of rigors of an Orthodox Jewish Sabbath again. But I did want to investigate what might I and my Christian community be able to introduce into our lives so that the way that I inhabit time, the way that I live in time, the way that I practice time might be reoriented. So I'm going to share a few fruits of my 10 years of thinking about that, trying to practice Sabbath keeping. I will say, I do it very inconsistently. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you my ideal, and then if you want to ask me what my actual real life looks like, I'll talk about that too. Uh, sometimes it looks like my ideal, and sometimes it looks very far from my ideal. But here are just some basic um, concepts that come to us from, from Jewish history and Christian history. The basic regulation or choreography for a Jewish Sabbath is twofold. It is, on the Sabbath, you do not work and you do do things that are joyful. That's the basic twin set of practices. Avoid working and do joyful things. So the joyful stuff is a little um, more self-evident than the working. Like, again, corporate worship is joyful, leisurely meals with your friends and family, maybe taking a nap, taking a walk, um, a, a leisurely slower, kind of day where you're doing joyful things. If you're married, according to the rabbis, sex, you get brownie points for having sex on the Sabbath because that is joyful. So I'll just move on now from that topic. Um, that's joy. Avoiding working in the Jewish lexicon is a little more complex. Um, all of those things that I just listed, cooking, driving, ripping a sheet of paper in half, all of those fall under the rubric of things that you do not do on the Sabbath in order to avoid work. Now, obviously on some level it seems kind of absurd, right? Why is ripping a sheet of paper into work? Uh, the best answer to that question that I have ever read comes from a wonderful book called Holy Days by Liz Harris. Liz Harris, the book was probably you now 25 years old. Liz Harris was a reporter for the New Yorker she was basically a secular Jewish person, and she was sent by the New Yorker to hang out for a year with a very orthodox family in Brooklyn. She began spending a lot of time with them. See, there it is, that whole spending time idiom. She began inhabiting a lot of time with this orthodox Jewish family, and um, she writes an account in her book about this experience of the first time she went to keep a Sabbath, pass a Sabbath, spend a Sabbath with them. And she's kind of, she's getting kind of frustrated that she can't make a phone call, she's not allowed to turn on any light switches, she can't break a circuit, she can't, you know, boil water for a cup of tea. She's getting frustrated by all of these restrictions and she asks her host, why is ripping a sheet of paper into work? Why is, um, there's a, a regulation that you're not even supposed to walk across a field of grass because you might accidentally rip a stalk of grass into, why is that work? The answer that she receives, I think, is wonderful. Her host says to her, on the Sabbath, the things that we avoid are things that change creation. 
Maybe they changed creation in a very small way. Ripping a sheet of paper in two is a small thing, but it indeed does create two sheets of paper where there used to be one sheet of paper. Boiling a cup of water is a small thing, but indeed it creates steam where there had once been water, right? Then her host goes on to say, what happens when for one day a week we stop changing creation? What happens, her host says, is that we have the spiritual opportunity to remember that we are not the creator. We are creatures. And so in a sense, the Sabbath, this pattern of resting from our work for one day of every seven, in a sense, that pattern is an invitation to sort of reorder our posture vis-a-vis -vis God, that, that during the week, during the work week, during our good, holy, accomplishing work weeks. Um, we're accomplishing things. We sometimes feel that we're in charge of things. We move out of this posture of saying, fundamentally, I am a creature who was created by God. I am sustained by God. Everything I do, I can do precisely because I am being sustained by God. And to have this weekly Sabbath practice is to have an opportunity to remember um, that we are the creature. We are not the creator. Um, I think I just want to say one more thing. I misjudged and actually have about seven hours worth of notes up here to share with you on this topic. Um, I'm just going to say one more thing and then I will uh, see if anyone has any questions or comments that you would like to make. Um, the final thing that I want to say about this has to do with the Bible. Um, the most frequently repeated commandment in the Old Testament is the commandment to keep or honor the Sabbath. More than honoring your parents, more than anything to do with property or, to bring it up again, sex, more than any, any of the sort of um, worship regulations to do with sacrifices, the most frequently reiterated, the most frequently repeated commandment is the commandment to keep and honor the Sabbath. Now, I don't think that means that it's necessarily the most important thing to God, but it does sort of suggest that it is somewhat important, right? God says over and over and over to the children of Israel, practice a Sabbath. And of course, the first instance of that Sabbath instruction or Sabbath commandment comes in the creation story where God himself takes a Sabbath. And I think the way that I finally like to think about Sabbath keeping is not, you know, we have to do this, we are obligated. I mean, it is one of the Ten Commandments, but if we want to set aside the question of whether we have to keep a Sabbath and actually realize that the Sabbath is an invitation and it's an invitation to be with God in a particular way. I think that God didn't have to invite us into God's own Sabbath practice. Like I'm fairly confident that the glories of divine solitude are indeed fairly glorious and God could have experienced a perfectly lovely, joyful Sabbath without us there, <laughs> keeping the Sabbath with him. And yet, in a sense, if you think of all of scripture, all of scripture is the story of God wanting to be in relationship with us, God wanting to hang out with us, God wanting to pass the time with us, God wanting to have communion with us. That's what the event at Sinai is about. That's what the covenant with Abraham, the covenant with Moses are about. That's what Jesus is about, right? God's preeminent indicator that God wants to be in relationship with us. But the very first indicator that God wants to have life with us is God's own invitation to us to do Sabbath with God. Um, and when I think about Sabbath that way, that this is an invitation from God to be with God in a particularly focused way once a week, then I ask myself, why on earth do I actually quite regularly say no to that invitation? Why don't, why don't I actually say yes to that invitation every week. Um, all right, I'm going to stop there. It is 10.05, so we have some time. Um, questions, comments, I'm really hard of hearing, and so I'm going to come to you with the microphone if you have a question or comment. 
Um, so be prepared to speak into the mic. God bless you. Yes. Since you're from Duke, you'll appreciate this. A very good lawyer in North Carolina told me one time, he said, Saturday is for your family and Sunday is for you. Is that a very selfish statement? Saturday is for your family and Sunday is for you. I just think that that's a weird and confusing statement. I don't know if that's selfish exactly. Um, what do you think of that statement? <laughs> Sadly, uh, no. I think it sounds pretty good. <laughs> Why? Uh, because I think probably at least I too much tend to sometimes work on Sunday, and I think it's probably healthy to take Sunday and say I'm going to do what I think needs to prepare me for the rest of the week. Yeah. But it sounds when he said that he's he, he really a very brilliant lawyer and teaches uh, estate planning. At, uh, he's done courses at Duke, planning. and uh, he thought that that was the appropriate way to live. I'm going to ponder that. I, I, there is something about that formulation that strikes me as unsettling. Um, I think part of what might strike me as unsettling about that formulation is actually sort of the bifurcation. Like, and now I'm thinking off the top of my head here, but like, is time not, I mean, take the category of family. If one has a family, in some way isn't the whole of the week for your family in particular ways, and isn't the whole of the week I, mean, I think if you're just sort of setting aside, I'm doing what I need to do for myself. On the one hand, it could sound that that is selfish. On the other hand, that's it. I only get to do things that I need to do for myself on Sunday. And I think the I think I want to say that the call of the Christian life is more integrated and integrative than that. So I think that might be what I find unsettling about that permission. But I'm going to keep pondering it. Other questions? Yes. Yeah. I feel like a lot of the conversations that I hear about Sabbath. And go figure, I hear them on Facebook, is about tech Sabbath. Can you talk about technology yeah. and Sabbath practice? Yeah. That's a great question. So first of all, I am unrepresentative of my generation in that I think I'm like the only person under 40 who's not on Facebook. Um, and I, I, social media make me uncomfortable. Um, I don't know why I just walked back up here, but here I am. Um, I do think that technology is a huge, all of these technologies are, are potentially good things. They connect us to each other, etc. That said, I think that a huge piece of the craziness of how we live in time has to do with, where is my cell phone? Has to do with this device, right? And I think particularly for those of us who are in a professional workplace, you know, the labor movement got us this 40 hour work week and with those devices, we just handed it right back. We just handed it right back. So there's a way in which, I mean, blame Edison and the light bulb maybe on the one hand, but that these technologies have sort of flattened time and all time seems to be sort of the same. So I can always potentially be working for my job. Like I might always be getting an email. Um, so I think that if one, if one wanted to institute a small Sabbath-like practice, just one step in the direction of Sabbath keeping, I think that actually saying for one day a week, or if that's too horrifying to start with, for half a day a week, I will not check my email, I will not get on Facebook or what have you. And again, it's not that those things are inherently bad, but I think that they mean that we're always on in a, in a particular way. Um, and I'll be honest with you, I am not currently in a season where I'm not using my cell phone one day a week, but I have done that. I've had years where I've had a day a week where I don't check my email or check my cell phone, and it was pretty transforming, and now I'm not doing it. Thanks for bringing that up for me. <laughs> okay, so I'm married to clergy. Mm -hmm. So sometimes people like to give me excuses as to why they're not in church on Sunday, which I love. love but that. they mainly center around the fact that that is their one day that is not structured by someone right. or something else. Right. But that to me says you're giving the power elsewhere. Yeah. 
So what do you say about that need to be in church and to have some sort of joint worship rather than being at the church of the Holy Comforter? Yes, the church is like I love it. I also, as a priest, I find it extremely uncomfortable when I run into someone in town and they like tell me why they weren't in church on Sunday. Because frankly, I didn't notice. I mean, it, it, there's a sort of narcissism of like Richard actually does not notice. I mean, if you're not here for weeks and weeks, he might. But like calling it to his attention, you don't need to do that. He didn't notice. There's too many of you. Uh, and I, I'm a priest at a church with 25 people, and I don't notice, let alone hundreds and hundreds. Seriously. Um, so part of my frustration with myself and others when we um, say, oh, that's the only time I have to do X and Y, is that somehow for thousands of years, Jewish communities have managed. And at other points in Christian history, Christian community managed too. Like there were moments in the history of the church where people had a robust Sabbath practice. Um, so I actually don't think that we are powerless. I think that we, we do live in a culture that prompts us to make certain choices, like encourages us in one direction or the other. But I, I'm going to make, I'm now going to make some assumptions about who is in this room and forgive me if they are wrong. Most of us in this room have, to put it bluntly, enough economic privilege that we have a lot of choices in these, in these areas. I think that there are people in our society who have fewer choices, right? And we hear that 11 o'clock on Sunday morning is the most segregated hour of the week. It's actually the most class segregated hour, right? Because this is the hour now that everything is open 24 seven, this is the hour that the people with the least power wind up actually working, like are actually at Walmart now. It is, it is mothers working two jobs are not in church because they, they really don't have the choice, right? So part of my, um, journey with this question is is around this question of like my own privilege and where do I have choices and what choices do I have that some other people do not have and I had this um, this sort of mini epiphany about this have people read Barbara Ehrenreich's book nickel and dimed this is a great book if you've not read it Barbara Ehrenreich goes undercover basically to work minimum wage jobs and see if she can make it and she more or less cannot um, and I had just read her book, this was a couple of years ago now, Nickel and Dime, and I was, because I was having a good Sabbath practice, and I'm going to do this today after lunch, after church too, I went out to lunch with a friend. That is what I will be doing after the 1130 service. I'll be going out to brunch with a friend in Memphis. So I was doing this in Durham, out to lunch, leisurely, Sabbathy lunch, and I realized about halfway through uh, I live in North Carolina, we have the largest per capita Latino population in the country of any state, then my Latino waitress was also likely a Christian. And my wonderfully restful lunch at this restaurant with my leisurely time with my church friend was happening on the back of her, probably her second job, and she probably didn't have health insurance, and she was probably, you know, barely holding body and soul together. And what that moment made me begin to ask myself was, if I am going to talk about rest and talk about living in time well, and talk about what kind of control I have over my time and what kind of choices I'm making, if I'm going to try to have one day a week where I am intentionally resting with God and neighbor and self in a particular way, then that needs to have some impact on how I'm working the rest of the week and what I'm working for and that part of what I think those of us who have, the, in, in a sense, the luxury to sit here and even have this conversation, what we need to be working for is a world where everyone has the opportunity to keep a Sabbath or berate themselves for not, <laughs> you know? Um, and it, it, is deeply, um, it is deeply unsettling to me, and I don't, I don't know what to say about it other than that, than that I am unsettled, that in a sense, we live in a culture where our spiritual lives have become a leisure activity. And that our spiritual lives are, well, I'll just speak for myself, that much of how I structure my spiritual life is inseparable from the fact that I am a professional person who has a little bit of spare income and some control over my time. Like another example of that would be, um, I'm leading some, a group from my parish in a couple of months. 
on a three-day silent retreat at a retreat center outside of Greensboro. It's going to be wonderful. I love retreating. I think retreating is a crucial part of the Christian pattern of life. I encourage everyone to go on a silent retreat. As I've been planning this, I've realized how silence is now something we have to pay for. And that many of the public spaces, like those libraries that got open on Sundays, um, parks, like many of the public spaces where people had quiet have, are, are not as widely available. And so now I can go have my quiet retreat time because I'm going to pay $100 a day to go stay at this retreat center. So this is a digression, obviously, from our core topic. But um, I think looking at how our own privilege and our life with leisure intersects with our spiritual life. I, I, again, I, I don't have anything to say about it other than that I feel unsettled and it. I think what you do on a Sunday has a lot to do with that. We will meet in the middle. <laughs> okay, so I have the luxury of having a vocation I love. Yeah. And I'm often critiqued because, for example, on my Sabbath, I typically read theology. So what do you do if your job if is something you love. you love and is actually a bit of leisure? The whole day is leisure because you're actually just loving and what it is that you're doing. So I share that. I feel very lucky in that the only time I've ever had a job I did not love was when I worked briefly as a hospital chaplain and I was terrible at it and hated it. Um, I was so bad at it. That's another story. Um, and by the way, I didn't really want to go to church that summer because suddenly my weekend was my real time, right, to do, to do what I wanted to do and I had this job that was just what I had to do between 8 and 6 every day. Um, so I too love my work and I feel very lucky about that and I often feel like I don't have enough time to do the parts of my work that I love the most. The writing, I'd love to spend, spend more time, I'd love to pass more time um, writing reading for my sermons, reading theology. So I will not speak for you. I will just speak for myself and say, I have to diagnose my own, again, like sort of insane workaholism. And if I am not, I mean, it is great that I have a job that I love. If I am not actually capable of loving anything else for a day, then something is very wrong. I mean, it's, for me, it becomes sort of sick, twisted, and knotted up. So I would not offer a critique of you. I would just invite you to explore whether there might be other things that you would love. Yes? You know, I never used the phrase wasting time today. Wasting time. I haven't used it. Um, I do waste time. And I think that wasting time is probably necessary. We need, you know, sometimes I will berate myself for, so the way that I waste time is I will be writing at my computer and I'll um, go online to Etsy, which is this website that has lots of like vintage and handcrafted artistic things and jewelry, and I'll just look around at it for half an hour. Total waste of time, but there is some way in which some of the time wasting I think we need, right? We can't actually be on, we are not machines, we can't just be on constantly. So, um, do you want to say something about wasting time? No. I was just curious, you never used the term. And, but I think the technology is overstimulated. So I think it's going to alter our brain. I think that that's right. I mean, I know nothing about this other than what I've heard on NPR, obviously, uh, because I'm not a neuroscientist. But it does seem that the technology is, for good and for ill, right, reframing our neural pathways. I'm sure there are people in the room who actually know something about this, so I'm not going to say anything more about it. Um, first, I should preface that I'm a language professor, so I'm when you talk about passing time, um, in Spanish, for example, that's exactly what you do. Mm. And we also have the word in English, a pastime. Mm -hmm. What is your mm. pastime? Is everyone hearing this? Yeah, good. And I think that that's um, important to remember. Mm -hmm. and in light of what you were just talking about at your retreat, you will be spending money. I think there it is indeed applicable that you're spending right. time because it means you're also spending money. Right. So perhaps you could think about the things that don't have financial reference to be your pastimes. I mean, a pastime could be reading, a pastime could be jogging, a pastime 
those are absolutely and it's a word that's not used as much in English. It's used an awful lot in Spanish, for example. And I always try and share with students, you know, think about in, in, in English. And this is something when you mention it just comes up. Yeah. Uh, we yeah. Need that's billions great. of time of instances. That's great. And um, I think we need to in focusing on the word pastime in English because it exists. It's not used as much. It indeed exists. So I think that's an awesome point. And the, what leads to my mind is what is the difference between a pastime and a hobby? You know, and that these different words do place us in different relationship to what we're talking about. I just read over the summer and fall a wonderful book um, called The True Secret of Writing. It's by Natalie Goldberg. She is a, a Buddhist practitioner and a writing teacher. She wrote, uh, her most famous writing book is called Writing Down the Bones, which is not my favorite. But this new book, I, I actually basically found myself reading it devotionally in a very slow way over the summer and fall. And um, Natalie Goldberg will convene a group of students for a year to do retreats that are sort of half Buddhist practice retreat and half writing retreat. And the group will meet with her for four, I think a week or maybe four 10 day units of time. And then she has them doing certain things during the time that they are not actually with her in person. And one of the things that she asks them to do over the course of the year is to adopt one practice that they will do, I think she says five or six times a week during this year, one practice. And the way that she defines practice, I mean, in a sense, what you, you all will be talking about for the next four weeks are practices, and we talk a lot about practices in the life of the faith and spiritual practices. Natalie Goldberg's definition of practice, I think, is remarkable. She says a practice is simply something undertaken with no hope of outcome. It is something you undertake with no thought of what the outcome is. Now, it may be that this was so arresting to me because I've almost never done that. Truly, there's very little in my life that I can say I have no hope of outcome. But that is what comes to mind when you speak about pastime. And for, for me, maybe the difference between a pastime and a hobby, right, might be that the hobby becomes another goal-oriented task and I'm probably spending money to do it, and I have some outcome. Not that outcomes are bad, I mean, we love outcomes, they're fantastic, but what does it mean to undertake something where there is no hope of outcome? You are simply doing the thing for the thing in and of itself. Your record is standing up to take the microphone away from me. <laughs> um, so, we have church. I'm gonna be in church, but I'm very happy and would be delighted to linger if those of you Lauren's going to sign books. There you go. Here's at the table. We have time for one more question. Oh, do you have it? Yes. Um, <laughs> how does eternal rest, because it was missing from the talk, how does eternal rest relate to your concept of heaven and you have one full minute? A full minute? Okay. I can do it in less than a minute. Um, the Christian tradition and our scriptures don't say very much about what happens after this life, but they say a few things. And I believe that the few things that we do know about the afterlife should have some impact on how we live now. So for example, we all say in our creed that we are anticipating being resurrected in our bodies. And that has some implication for what we think our bodies are and what we use them for and how we live in our bodies. So the Jewish tradition and the Christian tradition both say that paradoxically in the afterlife, we will have both an eternal Sabbath and we will have perfectly ordered work. So I don't know how both of those things go together. They are one of the many paradoxes of our faith, but it is, um, it captures my imagination that we know that we are heading toward an eternity in which we have both true and endless Sabbath and rightly ordered just um, soul nourishing work and somehow that should have some implication for what we are doing in the pre hereafter the end thank you for coming